Hello and welcome to this edition of Counterpoint Countercast. I'm your host, Scott Stannis, one of the cartoonists here at Counterpoint. It is Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. Uh, being joined here by one of the greats of our field, uh, truly one of the great people and one of the great cartoonists, Harvard grad, Brighton Bears basketball team manager slash player, cartoonist for the Economist, Baltimore Sun, Counterpoint, award winning. He does animations. Is there anything he doesn't do? Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Callagher, affectionately known to those of us who love his work and love him as Cal. Cal, thanks for joining us. Hey, God, it's so great to be here, my friend. Yeah, I, you know, I was looking, oh, I mean, this is, I mean, okay, I, I, we're going to go into all the cartooning stuff and all that, right, in a minute, but but I got to ask you, mm. semi-pro basketball player, is that, now semi-pro just seems like you can't commit. <laughs> what does that, what did that mean? You were with the Brighton Bear, uh, Brighton Bears basketball team, you're a manager and a player, what, what exactly, what's the story there, you got to tell us. Yeah, so uh, essentially, I, I graduated from university and, and immediately led a bicycle tour of American teenagers around uh, England and Scotland. And when the, the team, I'm sorry, the, the, the tour finished, they all went back and I was cycling around. And the, my basketball coach at Harvard had, was in England at a basketball clinic with coaches and things like that. And somebody says, hey, we're looking for Americans because in those days, each team could allow to have two foreigners on the team. They still have rules similar to that today, but almost always those days it was Americans. Today, it could be global um, athletes. So um, the guy said, well, there's a guy on a bicycle in Ireland right now, if you can find him. You know, you know, <laughs> long and short is that I connected with the Brighton Basketball Club. And I played for three years. And, um, and, and during that time, the team expanded and grew and got so much better. And I was also the head coach at the same time of the uh, Sussex University basketball team, which I coached for 10 years in the wow. UK. And um, I tell you, it was a complete blast. And um, um, I, I, I learned a lot. And some of the kids that I was teaching when I first arrived, who were eight and nine, were getting U.S. college scholarships by the time I was leaving. And now the basketball's really taken off over there. But I, but yeah, I mean, I, I played and I was playing right up to not long ago. And I just, basketball is the best sport in the planet. So you were, wait a minute, you were on the Harvard basketball team? Yeah, so the, and remember back in those days, my God, in the 70s, so this is 40 some odd years ago, right? So in those days, they, just like in high schools, they would have a freshman team, they would have a JV team, they would have a varsity team. So I didn't play in the varsity, but I played on, on, the, on their, their club team, which was called the Harvard Classics. And we, we toured the country playing other teams. And we, we, we played teams around the world. We, we uh, went to Portugal and Puerto Rico and elsewhere. Uh, and we were kind of like in a... Um, a combination of improv comedy team and a basketball team. <laughs> and we were fantastic. <laughs> Is there any was, video of this or I guess 16 millimeter film <laughs> what or whatever they were using back then? Oh, but we just had a blast. And I brought my puppet with me and we, we got up all such hijinks and we played a lot of great basketball and, and many of those players um, went on to play in Europe as well. Well, you're, you, you really have, and you truly deserve a reputation as being a kind, gentle, nice man. But I can say that when you're on the basketball court, all of that goes away because I played with you, I think, in Newport, Rhode Island one time. Okay. And you were um, uh, competitive. Well, there was a, there was a uh, coach named Jimmy Valvano, Jimmy V, who sure. was quite a guy. And he was at a basketball camp when I was about 15. And um, uh, there was a couple of hundred kids there. And they were doing a special drill about the half-court zone um, trap as a defensive maneuver and he brought uh, several people on there and he was instructing and I was to be the ball handler and they were going to try to trap me and then set up the whole thing and I kept on breaking it the whole time right and and he stopped the whole exercise at one point and he says a kid what's your name and I said uh Callahers, coach and he says Callaher you're the toughest little shit I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, Oh, that's a badge of honor right there. Oh, seriously, when we played, that was, the, I mean, like I said, this whole facade of, of nicety just, just went away for an hour or two we played. and Yeah. And but it's also, I have to tell you, when I was coaching, you know, um, I, I, I tried to instill lessons in life to all the, all the kids that I, was, that I was working with, which is about, you know, you, you play hard and you work hard 
you and you live gentle. So it's this whole combination of of you you play hard, but it's uh, play by the rules. Um, you know, uh, act properly, and then we can all kind of get along together if everybody respects and understands the the rules. Wow. Well. Okay, because I just remember playing you and it was hard. <laughs> it was you were you were tough. And this is when we, all of us were, well, younger, I guess. So okay, so you go from coaching basketball in Brighton and in, in Sussex, and you go from that to being an editorial cartoonist, which of course is a natural oh, transition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who amongst us hasn't walked <laughs> that road? How does that happen? Yes. Well, this the story was is the, the basketball team was having financial trouble. And they would give me do all sorts of things to try to help make money. So I did some basketball cl clinics at schools and stuff like that. And um, they got me one job as a maintenance man at a local public school, which in the UK is a private school. And I was, you know, it was a terrible job. I was, I was the youngest by 40 years of the entire uh, maintenance staff. And they thought I was there to spy on them, by the way, that I'd been sent there by the bursar to spy on them. So they were giving me the worst possible jobs they could possibly imagine. And I got it. I saw one day I was, I was peeling wallpaper in the art department. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm on this country. The basketball is okay, but they're paying me a dollar and change an hour, you know, what am I doing? So what I did is I drew cartoons in the wallpaper first, right? I was just drawing lots of cartoons before it's great. And the art teacher walks in and the art teacher sees this and starts chatting, here's my accent, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I wanna be a cartoonist. He said, well, you know what? Right off campus over here is um, a, a guy, one of my students, his father runs an ad agency in London. Why don't you go see him? So I, at, you know, six o'clock that day, you know, I'm at the door knocking with my portfolio on my arm and the door opens this much. He's not going to let me across his mantle. And, but, but then these two little girls come to you, they're like six and seven. And um, they recognize because, because one of the things I also did was street entertainment. I had a puppet and I would do ventriloquist acts on the street in order to make some money. And so they said, dad is the puppet guy, Bob. So he says, all right, come on inside. So I go inside, chat with him, and he invites me up to London to visit his art director. And when I met the art director, he, he said he didn't have any work there, but he gave me a list of all the newspapers, all the art directors, their phone numbers, and said, tell him I sent you. So for the next three months, I would do some stupid job in Brighton for pound an hour, in the morning. In the afternoon, I go to London and visit one or two places. And then in the evening, we have basketball practice and the games are on the weekends. So this went on, oh, it was like from December till April. And everyone was very kind, but there's no pickups. The last one on the list was The Economist. So I show up at The Economist and you know, I'm picking up a copy in 1977. There was no photographs in The Economist. It was like this gray, turgid text, right? It was just like reading the Bible. And as I'm looking through this, I'm looking at more portfolio. I've got, you know, I've got uh, animation. That's not going to work. i got comic strips. That's not going to work. Gag cartoons. Now, the only thing I had that would work was six caricatures of Harvard professors. That's all I could show. I thought my life is through, you know, I'm heading home. And I showed the art director and he says, hey, hmm, leave these with me, you know, you know, and so two days later, he calls me, he says, you're not going to believe this. But well, one of our, our, our editors here, her husband teaches at Harvard, he recognized these people. Another guy, he's the head of the Harvard Club of Great Britain. He recognized these guys. Oh, cool. and we them next Wednesday for a one day trial. So Tuesday night, we have basketball practice. The practice goes till 10. The pubs close at 1030. So the fastest we run all night was from the gym to the pub to get a couple <laughs> of pints. In. And I'm sitting <laughs> chatting with my mates. And I say, guys, look, I don't know anything about British politics. I'm 21 years old. I don't know anything. Can you tell me about British politics? And they, they, just, they just laugh and they say, no, what you need to do is go home, turn on the telly and watch Newsnight, which was their equivalent of Nightline. So maybe I'll learn something. So I turn on Newsnight and they're interviewing the number two in the country, Dennis Healy. Dennis Healy has got this magnificent face for caricature. It's got big round red face, right? Tomato like face. He's got bunny rabbit teeth. He's got eyebrows <laughs> that go to the ceiling. You know, he's, a, he's perfect. And I'm sketching, right? Like, like, you know, looking at a screen like we are now, right? 
And now it's, but now it's getting toward midnight. I could be in London in the morning. So I show up to the economist the next day and they say, all right, Cal, for your one day trial, we want you to draw Dennis Healy. No way. And it That was it, dude. I have been ever <laughs> since, man, 43. <laughs> Can you well, believe that? The cartoon gods were looking favorably on you, my son. God, that's right. amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> And so, yeah, and that became that gig. Now the gig, at, now you also draw for the Baltimore Sun. I think you began in 1988. Am I remembering that correctly? Um, Already, yeah, 88. Mm -hmm. Now, how did that happen? Because you're over in England doing your thing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we, um, I was, uh, I came, we, for those who, who are unfamiliar, the, you know, we, the cart editorial cartoons, we have a professional organization called the AAEC, American Association of Editorial Cartoonists. And we have annual gatherings, right? So we got together. And so the, 1986, I believe we were in Washington, DC. I come over from England, which was really great for me to meet all these American cartoonists. And I've been in the UK for about a decade at this point. And um, someone told me at a cocktail party that there was a job going in Baltimore. And I never, I had never worked in America. So I thought I'd send a portfolio over and um, sure enough, you know, I got after some waiting and, 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 and uh, theatrics, I finally was able to come over. They offered me a job. My wife and I, my wife's English. We had two little English kids. And we thought we'd just try it out for two years. And I don't know, 30 some odd years later, we're still here. So that's kind of how that happened. Oh, my gosh. OK, so I mean, so you're in Baltimore. You do The Economist, obviously, digitally. I mean, so if you came to the U.S. in 88, with the deadlines and also how did you get your cartoons to the economist yeah yeah so we were the, i believe we were the first ones to use the the web as a transmission device when um when i first arrived here boy i mean it was just so so difficult to send a 300k file equivalent of an email it would take three hours I do, remember. do you remember i mean dial up because it was dial up it was complete that it and then the dot line would die and you'd have to start all over again. Or someone would pick up the other line in the house because we didn't have a dedicated line just for faxing. So someone, Janine, my wife, or my kids would pick it up. I go, oh, son of a bitch. And you go, you go screaming, no, no, no. And of course it screwed up the transmission. So you had to start all over and, and sending comic strips was 20 minutes a strip. Yes, right, right, right. That was well, the, um, uh, the kill. <laughs> Be honest, the first month I was here, we had to do this. I would finish my cartoon in Baltimore, drive to Washington, D.C., where they then would, they had this giant drum scanner that was um, at the basement of U.S. News and World Report. And they would do, that was for sending their covers from, from you know, from one place to another, evidently. So they would scan my uh, my artwork there, and then they would send it to a place in New Jersey. Then would, that would then print it out, and then scan it onto another thing. They would send it on a dedicated cable that would then arrive somewhere in london and then they would output it and then they would send it to the con and then a, a bike would come and pick it up from the economy oh man it looked like mud yeah and, yeah but eventually you know we got that but here's the favorite story and i, I don't want to bore you with this stuff no go ahead I, this is process was, i love this was the covers so i've done 140 some odd covers to the economist over the years in the early days so what do you do with co covers because it was early days we couldn't scan the color. There just wasn't the capacity or send them. So what would happen is they, they would call me on Monday and say, hey, we want to do um, X, Y, and Z. I would work on a cover. I'd have to have it finished by mid to late afternoon on Tuesday, so 24 hours. And then a, a courier would come to my house, pick it up, and then they would fly to London with it, right? So this kind of worked okay for a while until one day, they came to my high house, picked up the cover, and then on Wednesday when I called them in London, it hadn't arrived. They had lost the cover, and they were now full panic because in two hours, plates were going to be put onto, um, uh, 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 onto Concord to fly to, to Hong Kong to print the Asian edition. So they said, what can we do? So I said, well, look, I've got a pencil version of the artwork. I'll quickly just ink the out outline of it. I'll blow it up on a photocopier. I'll cut it into pieces. I will fax those six pieces over to you. Oh, then come they, on. They, yeah, I kid you not. Then they spray painted it to kind of color it in a little bit, and then they used it. So anyways, it was such a it was such a nightmare, and everyone was so frantic. They called me the next week and said, look, we can't do that anymore. So if we want you to do cover, we want you to get one of your friends 
we will pay one of your friends to fly to London no. with the artwork. Yes. So we had suddenly so many friends. <laughs> Our <laughs> Here's there. It's Chris. But you know, I tell you what was funny, Scott, is that like you and I could say now, oh yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. But but at the day, if somebody called you up Monday and said, Hey, Wednesday, can you fly to London and not come back till next Sunday? And so not everybody can, you know, can yeah. do that. So so it turns out we would go way down that list. And sometimes somebody from the walk one time I think my wife had to take it. And another time somebody from, from the Washington Bureau, the economist would have to take it. So Oh my God, that's amazing. I mean, the, the, when I started at the commercial appeal in Memphis, Tennessee, the um JP Alley was the um, was the cartoonist there, and he was helped him win the Pulitzer in the 1920s for you know boldly being against the Ku Klux Klan and lynching, which apparently oh, was oh, brave, I'm, I'm, was brave. I'm, yeah, I'm kind of on that. I'm on the anti lynching train too. Uh, to, to, to full disclosure here, but he would work. I mean, I, I mean, it's so funny back then when you didn't have the electronic transmission. He'd work in his little shack in the back of his house until noon had a standing order from the cab company. The, guy, the cab driver would stop by his house. He'd hand him the cartoon and he'd drive it down to the newspaper to be processed and he'd go play golf for the rest of the day. Um, what what's that? What time would he have done that? What time of the day? He was done by noon every day so he could go play golf. Noon to, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. God. Do you have to get that? Uh, no, that's a fax machine. Sorry about that. No, that's Wait, fuzzy. are you serious? No, it's, it's an answering machine, but we do have a fax machine. Wait, what? Okay, that doesn't make it better. You have an answering machine? Ah, yes. We, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. It's, oh, God. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> do you really have a fax machine? Uh, we, we did have. <laughs> yeah, because my mom business here, so she, 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 she has the fax plans and stuff like that. But we now um, email, of course, obviously. But we had, we, I think it's in a machine left over from that day. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, because, and the reason I'm laughing is you're also one of the most technologically forward looking right. cartoonists working. You have been since for your whole career. Uh, you talk about animations. Uh, you talk about, you're doing, uh, it would be fair to say they're gifts now, the one you just posted uh, yeah. to, to Counterpoint today. Um, mm -hmm. How did you, I mean, how did you get hooked on that? I mean, a, a handful of other cartoonists have done it. But you've always seen, you've always really kind of dove, I mean, you, you did the 3D cart, um, cartooning or, or animation rather a, f a number yeah. of years ago before most people were doing that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's, what's, what's the inspiration? Why did, you, why did you take your career in that direction? Well, I um, uh, Scott, my, back in 70s, 1977, when I graduated from university, my senior thesis was a 13 minute long animated cartoon based on a comic strip that I had in the college paper. And so can you imagine, you know, <laughs> thousands and thousands of drawings back in the day before computers, and it all had to be hand drawn. And it was a, it was a Herculean effort. And um, I had really got turned on to animation, you know, as a kid, you know, watching Looney Tunes and all this, all this stuff. Sure, that people, sure. So, I mean, I did love it, but I also, because when I am crafting um, many of my caricatures, I feel like some of the time, I'm less that I'm drawing them more than I'm building them. I'm kind of building a character. And that's kind of what you do in animation. You have to build a character and, and realize them so that when they move, they're, all their parts are moving. And it kind of, it's just a kind of a frame of mind that may. So maybe I came in with an animator's uh, perspective or uh, um, vision when I started visiting editorial cartoons. And I, I maybe thought that wouldn't this be a great dance together? So. Um, one of the real critical turning points for me, Scott, was I was 1986, I think it was, and I was in the UK and I just started with a, a, a new newspaper that just opened up in the UK at the time called Today. And um, uh, I, they came to me and said, we want to do a, a television commercial with your cartoons, okay, and it was going to be animated. I said, oh, great, but I'm knowing animation, I wanted to know who was going to do it. And they said, well, we've got Richard Williams studio to do it. Now, Richard Williams is one of the gods of animation. He, he's every person at animation school will read the book, the, the Bible about animation It's written by him. And um, he he's Canadian, but he has a studio in, in London and he was going to be animating. And I thought, oh, my God, I've died and gone to heaven. So I worked on uh, with him arm in arm 
on this bit, which was a cartoon that started with one of my cartoons in the paper that came alive. And then at the end of 30 seconds, it, it froze and came back into the newspaper as my cartoon. And um, won several international animation awards. And I still show it when I give talks because it's just so dynamic and so fun. And it's because it takes caricatures and makes them come alive. And I, from that moment, I just thought, my God, if we could do that, you know, political cartoons that are, you know, that can move and talk and do all that stuff, it would be amazing. But of course, in those days, it was hand drawn. Now, though, with the computer animation, I saw the computer. I said, "Oh my God, we could do this! Let's see if we could do this." And that's kind of where I've been ever since. And so today's cartoon had Donald Trump, you know, his head moving around, and I was having a blast doing it. Let me ask you because you mentioned this, and and because of your interest in animation, I mean, your work is very cinematic. You move, I. You know, when I try, try to describe this to people, the only way I can describe it is that you move the camera. You know, you take the camera and you say, well, this looks better if it's shot from above or this looks better if it's shot from a, a low angle or this looks better if it's shot from this from in profile or three, three quarter or whatever. I mean, that has that I'm guessing that influences your work a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, and uh, yeah, it, it kind of sense of dynamism and composition that, um, to be honest, what I think is interesting from the from the consumer's perspective, that we all collectively see so many films now, particularly now in, in times of COVID, the amount of you know the kind of packed in, in, in visuals that we've seen, and and the visuals in filmmaking these days is so much more sophisticated than ever before, and we're used to seeing things from all these different angles. And what I I believe, Scott, a part of my philosophy of cartooning of what we do is that. Um, we're in high competition on the visual uh, landscape with every for everyone's eyeballs. We have them for maybe six seconds or so, but we have to work. We're, we're competing in the newspaper with our own weather map, you know, as, as being the dominant you know, visual thing in the paper. But it used to be the cartoon was the visual thing. People went there and now the as there's color, there's movement, there's everywhere. There's stuff going on. So we have to maximize our opportunity of those six seconds to pull people in as best we can. And we all do it different ways. Some people do it in very strong, simple images. Some do them in, in, in great storytelling. Some do them with charm. We, we all know cartoonists who use different kind of yeah. facilities to do it. And in my case, I guess partly because I, I enjoy drawing and also because I, I'm getting pretty good at it now. I've been doing it for a little while. <laughs> is that I... <laughs> So I try to make something that I would like to look at. So I say, mm. oh, wouldn't it be that, that if I walk, oh, you know, turn to the page and it was like sort of at this angle or, or this character is doing this, it would be fun for me. And so that's what I aspire to do. Well, and that begs the question, if I could, um, didn't plan to go in this direction, but who do you, I mean, this is a question I rarely ask other cartoonists. Who do you draw for? I mean, you just mentioned drawing for you. Yeah. And I know I have to say for myself, if I make me laugh, yeah, then I, then I think it's a successful cartoon. I mean, are, are you drawing for someone in particular? Are you thinking of a specific audience, or are you just drawing for Cal? Do no, you I, the chips fall where they may? Um, it, you know, uh, you, I think you put on lots of different hats. Assuming this, that if you and, you and I can have a conversation, it can be a certain tone because you and I know each other. But the same conversation we might have with other people will take on a different kind of tone. And I know that because I work with three distinct audiences, you know, the, the counterpoint audience, which is being a, a, um, a digital online audience means that you can, um, you know, maybe a bit more freer and less constraints on, on mostly on, on imagery. Your ideas could be the same, but the way you, you, you deliver things can be maybe a, a little bit less restrained. If I'm working for The Economist, they have a very educated audience. Uh, you can assume a great deal more knowledge of them on certain subjects. But they also that you can't be an astute observer of the obvious unless you do something really in a beautiful beautiful group graphically so you have to respect um their kind of um education and their their no their notions and as a result when i write draw for them i, I really i'm hearing the voice of the economist in my head which i know so well the baltimore sun gives i over time i've earned a lot of um you know freedom there but you also always know that you're kind of in a family newspaper and so the nature of the language and even some of the metaphors you use um, kind of restricts that and you might, um, and also your subject matter clearly. So then, and, and so as a result, if I did the same subject for all three, there's some cartoons that could overlap in all three, but there's many times that I'd, I would probably draw a different cartoon for each of those three. 
Interesting. What I mean, so I've looked at you. I mean, obviously, before we did this interview, I actually do do some background and looked at a lot of your work. And how would you describe your because you seem to be an equal opportunity tormentor? Um, how would you describe your politics? I like to describe I'm, I'm, I'm an extremist. I'm an ex, I'm extremely independent is what I would say. And that I, um, I, I the line that I'm, I like to use and, and you're free to borrow it, Mr. Scott, <laughs> okay. is, that, is that I'm 100% in favor of everything that's right and 100% <laughs> against everything wrong. And I don't think any one party has a monopoly in all things right. And one of the things about my perspective, Scott, was, was forged during my time in the UK because I would be over there now I was doing um, political cartoons of a foreign country as an outsider, but people who were reading my cartoons didn't know that of me, but I could do a cartoon critical of the Labour Party, the left-wing party, or the Tories, the right-wing party, and not feel that I was betraying my tribe. Mm. And that enormous amount of freedom, and as a sense of detachment where you could see, you, you kind of carve through the emotional baggage that people bring to the table. And so when I returned back here, I kind of, um, I tried to cultivate that same perspective here as far as American politics are concerned. And being in the middle can be a, a tr problematic place. I mean, you, you get you know, stuff from both sides. Um, so it's not, some people look at it as the mushy middle. I think it's the sensible center. And I just think that, the, and the center is large. I mean, it's not like dead in the middle and everybody's you idea. Still, you still believe that even today in America that the center is large? It is. I think that just last year, um, or maybe it was earlier this year, that um, just from as far as uh, um, attachments, the way that people self-identify, is that the largest group in American politics is the independent stroke non-aligned in the middle. That group is larger than those who identify as Republicans. That group is larger than those who identify as Democrats. And that's so if it's like 35 Republican and 30 Democrat, let's say, then the rest is, you know, smack this other group. So um, it's so I think that that's I, I think as a, I think to be honest, I think that's where the spirit of America is and the heart of America is. But it's the noise that the outside makes. It's the same that in any society, that little, that 10% that causes the crimes, it does this or make, make, really creates problems for everybody else. And I'd love to try to create an environment where those in the sensible center try to recapture um, their represented area. I'm going to very respectively agree to disagree with you. I think the center has eroded to an extreme degree. And because mm -hmm. Myself, I always considered myself right of center, uh, worked in Republican politics before I became a cartoonist. Uh, but I, being a never Trump Republican, I mean, just being there's no place for me. I mean, it's just I mean, obviously there is in, in the commentary world, but just in, in the world of politics, I don't see any centrist. I don't see I mean, centrist co candidates certainly don't win. Um, well. If I, I, I agree. I, you know what? I agree with you because in politics, there's no center, but I think America's in the center and they're not those, those voices are not being heard because those who are animated and politics is always driven to by the inertia. It's those people who aren't involved, who are not committed. And it's the committed folks that determine what's going on in the country. Now we're getting more tribal now. So there's more and more people getting committed and they're getting committed in, in a uh, passionate way, in a, in a very confrontational way. But I believe that the heart of the, the, of the country is in the middle, to be honest. And that's why so many of the, the bat battles have to be, you know, the primaries are always fought in the extremes of the party, but yeah. they have to center in order to win the whole country. And I think that's what happens, especially left or right. You have, you know, the primaries, you can't, if you could not get through a, a Republican primary today, at least leave it, living here now in a, in a, in a blue state without being pro-Trump. I mean, not just pro-Trump, but stridently pro-Trump. And if you, and if you de deviate even a little bit, you're going to be eviscerated and you're not going to win the, 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 the primary. Now, if they, I, I don't know. I mean, I think Americans tend to be lean libertarian. They tend to lean, um, uh, you know, free markets. They tend to lean, but you're right. They do tend to lean independent because no party, there's no one-stop shopping for one party. I don't know. I just, I, I really am very, very, very scared about the future of the United States, um, especially electorally. Um, I think we're going to, in the 22, I mean, what's your prediction for the 22 midterms? 
Well, all all uh, midterms are all local, essentially, right? So there's all these small little local um, issues that are going on. We we know the kind of the bigger story, um, and and I I the Democrats. It all depends if the Democrats, you know, can. Um, can get something passed, but but also, I mean, a lot of people have already made up their mind right now. We're kind of in a, in a committed state, and um, then you know, typically everyone knows that the, the the ruling party loses seats. The margin of error for the Democrats is very narrow, and as soon as the as soon as Congress goes against Biden, his term is toast. It's just toast. Yeah, no, so, I, I agree. I, I think the Democrats have. I mean, they never seem to miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity, as I mentioned in my blurb this morning. I, and people think, well, Scott, why would a why would we listen to a Republican? What tell us what Democrats should be doing, and why do you care? And uh, for me, it's always it's I like good politics. As I mentioned, I came up in politics, and I'm just flabbergasted that you take the House, you take the Senate, you take the White House, and you can't get anything passed. I yeah, mean, that yeah. is a level of incompetence that is mind boggling. And the Republicans yeah. are they're united. They're they're, they're nuts. <laughs> they're united behind the totalitarian and weird little orange man, but that's yeah. where they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Democrats are just disappointing. I think they're going to lose. I think, like, as you said, I think you're going to have a Democratic House, a Democratic, Se I mean, a Republican House and a Republican Senate. And that's just going to be a mess. It's just going to mm -hmm. be, you talk about nothing getting done unless there's a catastrophe of, you know, knock wood that there isn't. But man, right. I'm just, um, I'm not, you're, you're much more optimistic. And that's always kind of been your, your personality you're more more of an upper i'm more of a, of a downer <laughs> so um anything else we need to cover before i also want to know where can we go to see your work where, where mm. do you want to direct people um what's the best place to see kevin callagher am i saying your last name correctly um uh, most no. people well callagher is good uh, the g is supposed to be silent but yeah. callagher okay yeah. Callaher. So where, 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 can, where, where, where can we see your work? Well, you can see me at, um, I do have a website, uh, caltoons.com, um, which I'd love to keep more up to date than I, than I do. I, I am on social media and um, I, you know, I like, um, I'm using Facebook, uh, the, but that's kind of, you know, for fans, I post that stuff there. I'm using Instagram more of Twitter. Um, I, I'm, I try to stay active on Twitter and um and I just love to hear from folks. Um, and then, of course, you can buy books and, and other stuff on my website if you're interested. Before I let you go, give me your progno prognostication on the future of editorial cartooning. Yeah, so um, you're going back to the glass half um, full kind of characterization. I'll start off by saying that the, um, the next generation, because you're always looking at the combination of what opportunities are there going to be and what's the next generation going to be doing. So the next generation is not going to be doing what you and I do. It's not going to be looking stuff on, on, on paper and may not be working in black and white. I'm one of the last people doing distinctly black and white editorial cartoons in a couple of my publications. And, um, and although you, you mourn that, you can also say that what's coming up next could be very exciting. I, I expect we'll, we'll see more animation and things of that nature. But I also think that right now there's more satire, more visual satire. And that's what we are, visual satirists. There's more visual satire than ever. And it's done by non-professionals. It's people doing um, you know, their own memes and, and their own little videos and their own little... Um, as in the UK say, piss takes about various different uh, elements of, of life, nonetheless politics. And I think that's really healthy for all societies to, to you know, in, in, engage with satire and use it um, as a form of expression. Now, as far as being paid to do it, um, I do also think that the more of those kind of opportunities will start to happen. I mean, we're in the wild west of this kind of time. And when I see something like Politico, I see something like counterpoint coming forward and saying, look, there's an appetite for these, for what we do. So um, come on, folks, pay, join us. And, and cartoons, people who watch cartoons, they love cartoons. So there's a place, it's finding a way that money can, 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 um, can, can connect with those people. And I think we're gonna have some ingenious um, people from the next generation um, finding that way. Yeah, no, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, so, well, Cal, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. It's always good to see you, man. And uh, yeah, this, we got to do this more often, buddy. <laughs> we will, and we shall.
Until next time, everybody, thanks for watching this edition of Counterpoint Countercast. I'm Scott Standis. Check us out at counterpoint.com. Please subscribe and support editorial cartooning. We have some of the best cartoonists in the country. Trust me on this. You won't be disappointed. Counterpoint.com. Until next time, we'll see you in the funny papers. Ow, 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 ow,